Well, greetings, everybody. It's my, my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce my friend Rashid Attar. Rashid is VP of Cloud Computing at Qualcomm. And uh, <laughs> you get to some level in your career and you can't talk without PowerPoint. <laughs> and, and, and so we will have a slide or two as well. Um, we've been working together now for, for months. Uh, we announced our partnership uh, last week, and I'm honored to have Rashid uh, with us to, to share a little bit about their view and what they're working on. Just, Rashid, welcome first. And why don't you tell everybody just a tiny little backswing. My guess is everybody here knows a little bit about Qualcomm, but why don't you share just a little bit. Firstly, Andrew, thanks for inviting, inviting me, inviting uh, Qualcomm to the event. Um, happy to be here. Um, at, at Qualcomm, we started our AI journey maybe a little over 15 years ago, 2007, 2008. Uh, didn't even call it quite AI at the time. Um, we started then. Um, it's been several years of innovation, focus on strictly on inference that led to lots of implementations of these technologies into our devices, all the way from smartphones to laptops to cars. And over the last few years, it's been you know, taking all of those same technologies, same core assets, adapting them for cloud. Um, and then over the last, uh, late last year, we announced our first deployment uh, in a public cloud at Amazon EC2 and since then additional cloud and, and so on. And uh, at this point in time, you'll find Qualcomm AI, both hardware and software, probably in billions of devices at any given point in time. You get to use big numbers in the consumer side, don't you? <laughs> billions, of, billions of devices, that sounds nice. <laughs> um, you know, when I think of Qualcomm, we usually think of, of edge devices, right? And, and your, your Ultra 100 and your AI 100 are, are data center d d devices. Um, tell us a little bit about the, the, the tensions or, or why you guys pushed from the, from the edge to, to, to the data center. So as we looked at, you know, we, we got very good at doing AI inference at the edge. As we looked at where AI was going, where inference was scaling in, I think this is really bright. <laughs> <laughs> That's white. <laughs> so as we saw uh, where inference was going, uh, there was clearly the edge component, which we've been working on, but there was also clear need for very high performance per watt, uh, price performance solutions in the cloud. And there was various sets of applications where you had things being done at the edge, but then you wanted digital twins in the cloud. Uh, that has naturally led to these technologies, obviously adapted for the cloud, being uh, deployed in the cloud and, and being done at a larger, at a different scale. You know, when I looked at your, your Ultra 100, one of the things that struck me was that it, it, it feels like it has a tradition of, of, of low power compute, right? I mean, it, it feels like some of the, uh, some of the thinking that, that is necessary in consumer devices where they're running on batteries or they're running where power is everything has been brought because it's, it's such a power efficient uh, inference engine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the AI100 Ultra, it's based on a lot of the core technologies we developed for mobile, obviously adapted for cloud, but it has in terms of even the way we get more memory bandwidth, it's by adding and, and we're using low power memory. So it's all built on LPDDR, which is denser. Uh, you know, the single device has 128 gig of uh, on-card storage, which is, for its class of products, quite compelling. And that thinking, that uh, focus on price performance, uh, re you know, supporting a breadth of models, right? It's not. This particular product was designed for LLMs, but it does really good for computer vision, natural language processing, which is largely embedding models in the context of LLMs uh, as well. So yes, that, that theme, that focus on low power, price performance, dense compute, 
has followed us through uh, on these class of products as well. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about maybe we can share some thoughts uh, on the rise of inference as a workload. And tell us about your thoughts. So I think we were one of the few or early companies who noticed the need for AI inference on a handheld device. That's where the early research started, and I think we, we brought this to handle devices in the 2015, 16 uh, timeframe. That was, I think, our first generation products. And more and more has been built up over there. But as we observed the market a few years later, as we started developing products for targeted towards cloud, we realized that you know, you're going to train a lot of models, and the models will be big. But at the end of the day, when you're done, you're there's a lot to infer with. So you may train the model once, but you're probably going to run inference, you know, billions of times, hundreds of billions of times. So there, the price uh, performance, the, the cost aspect would become key. The easy to access, easy to make work, run with just about any form factor servers, or, or just, you know, build a card that will plug into just about any server and just work, would become quite critical. And that's proving out now. So if you notice some of the announcements from some of the biggest players in the industry, they're noticing inferences now starting to get to at least on par and you know, over time exceed uh, training. And that's where you know, there, there's a massive demand. Uh, not everyone can afford it at the prices it's at today. If you buy a product for training and try and reuse it for inference, uh, that's where products of this class become critical, and pushing the boundaries on performance with these products is even more important just because of the, the demand and the cost without it. Yeah, that, that was an area where, where we found a very uh, a sort of kindred spirit with, with Qualcomm, right? The, uh, there are four compute steps in, in, in AI, right? There's um, sort of your data prep, very little compute. Training, huge amount of compute. One customer, one model, huge compute. There's, once that's finished, the evaluation, very little compute. And then there's the inference. And the inference has different characteristics, right? It's modest compute, but it's a function of the number of users. So as the technology gets more successful, as you move from hundreds of thousands to millions or tens of millions of active users a day, the demand for inference goes up. And the demand for inference compute goes up. And, and that's um, a dynamic that interested us a great deal at, at, at Cerebrus, and a, a dynamic that we thought was important to get ahead of, because we, we know that if you don't drive down the cost of inference, all right, fewer people do inference. And then the impact of AI will be less in society. And so if you don't attack this uh, at, its, at its root to drive down this cost, and for those of us who, who spent, like I did, the first part of my career in networking, we, we know what happens when you make networking free. Right? I mean, that's, what that's why WhatsApp exists. That's why you have approximately 100% penetration in the world of, of WhatsApp. Right? Four people all over the world have free communication. Change the world. And when you think about AI and you think about how do we drive down the cost of inference to the point where um, it's not a burden, where you know, Microsoft doesn't cap you, right? Then you, you got to rip cost out of it. And that was really at the, at the essence of our partnership. We, we, we took a bunch of different tacks together. And you want to talk a little bit about how, how we did that? Absolutely. So be before we get into the specific techniques, you know, as we built our hardware and our software stack, the goal was always, you know, you can train, you can take a model that was trained anywhere, and in a few simple steps, we will allow or enable inference on our product. Having said that, those simple steps still take effort. And we were looking for, you know, the, the partnership made sense where we have a partner where you can have a model that's pre-trained, but you can also train the model knowing our architecture. So hardware-aware training, think of network architecture search as one example where you now optimize this, it's, the model is going to produce the same results, so the same quality results, but do so perhaps in a smaller size, perhaps faster, 
So that's one example. And as you go down, go down this list, we then looked at, OK, you can have a trained model. If you could run that same trained model, you had a sparse version of the model. And ideally, you want unstructured sparsity so that the, you know, the folks doing the training are not constrained in how they're setting up the model. If we have a solution on the other side for inference that can handle a unstructured sparse model through largely software means where you know where the zeros are and then you, you know, adapt for that and you, when you read the weights back in, you decompress and you use them. So that's a way to get yet another technique in where the partnership on the training side helps. So you have a model which could have been produced as is but you bring in sparsity and you know, we know how to handle sparsity on the other side. We have other new techniques. So if you, go, if you just look at this list, there's sparsity, which you know, Sean and others talked about earlier today. You can also have speculative decoding. So this is a very exciting technique where you have a target model, or in some cases, the teacher-student model, where the target model is the big one you have a small model using the same tokenizer, which will run ahead and produce a bunch of results. Odds are it's right a good 70, 80% of the time, and with that you get additional speed up. Now in order to do this, you need a training solution that is going to produce a draft model along with the target model. Because without the draft model, you can't apply speculative decode. Now, once you have that, you now want a, you know, on our side, on the inference side, we would handle uh, running both these models in, in a certain fashion to get you additional gain. Uh, and then, as you, if you look through this list, we, you know, Qualcomm was also one of the companies that, there were several others, uh, you know, Intel, Microsoft, AMD, um, uh, NVIDIA, that helped define a microscaling, uh, essentially a, lesser bit floating point format, if you will. And uh, we are one of the first to support it. And you know, with, that additional, uh, with, with that additional feature added, so as you go down this list, there's a bunch of these features. These are all state-of-the-art features today. We don't know what the research community will produce in the coming months. Right. But through this partnership, we'll always be at the vanguard of adapting these, you know, understanding these techniques, delivering trained models which take advantage of these techniques, and having an inference solution uh, ready to run these models. And, you know, you can go from three steps to take a trained model to infer to no steps, because when the model is released, it'll come with a fully optimized, ready to deploy, ready to infer model. You know, I. As I've thought about this partnership, um, it sounds obvious, right? That, that if you train a model knowing the hardware that, that is going to do the inference, you can make optimizations for it, right? And we, we've seen this again and again in our space over the years, that um, w once you know the user, <laughs> right, uh, of the trained model, you, you can do all sorts of things that, that, that bring costs out and drive performance up. And, and that's really what, what we've done together. We identified a series of techniques. Um, and these techniques were algorithmic. These techniques were compression. These techniques were searching for optimizations in the model architecture that could be advantaged by the underlying hardware. These are all cutting edge techniques. And we can rip out 90% of the cost of, of doing inference. And together, I, I think that's an enormously powerful thing. And I, I think as we look forward, you're going to see more and more of this uh, across the industry. And I, I think it's not just the, 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 these. These are illustrative, right? It turns out that we're the best in the, the, the world at, at sparsity. Uh, it turns out that, that the Ultra 100 is very, very good sparse engine um, in inference, right? Right, so you, you, you get two and a half X performance gain. Um, but there are gonna be new and other inventions over the, the months and years ahead, and each time we will be able to collaborate, stay on top, and, and drive, uh, uh, 
drive cost out of the system. When you drive cost out of the system, what happens? More people use it. More people use it. The diffusion of AI and the benefits of AI spread. And th that's really sort of what is the passion for, uh, for Rashid and I is, is how, do we, how do we push AI into the community? And you got trained models. You, you got to infer uh, on models. You got to get good data sets. And people need to collaborate so that, so that we can rip this cost out. That's exactly right. You know, in this, <clears throat> just this example, we've got four techniques. Uh, not all are completely additive, but cumulatively we estimate you, we deliver about 10x improvement. And you can slice this in different ways. You could make a particular solution faster. You can enable multiple users with that additional throughput that you've achieved. And here's the interesting piece. As we push on these techniques, you know, all the way from cloud to other devices, you can see that because of these techniques, more and more can be done more broadly, not just in the cloud. And, and that's exciting because, you know, the ultimate future of AI is there's this range of uses. There'll be some in the cloud, there'll be some in the car, there'll be some on a laptop, and, and so on. Yeah, and th th that's when those of us who, who live to train models see the impact of their models everywhere, right? In, a, in exactly that description is, you don't have to have your laptop, you don't have to have your phone. It, it is sort of embedded in the fabric of your life. And you can only do that when inference costs uh, get really, really low. With that, I want to thank Rashid. I want to thank you so much for uh, coming today. Let's give Rashid a round of uh, applause. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. All right.